Thanks very much, uh, Peter and Peter, and also to Kevin Bishop, who helped key me in to, to the conference. Um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a, it's a, a privilege for me to be able to be here in a, in a national park. I mean, my current job doesn't make that often that possible, although the title would appear differently. Um, but I do have uh, the honor to go through some of the outcomes of a very important meeting that was held just last November in Sydney and give you an idea of, of the kind of thinking that is going on in the world about where protected areas and conserved areas and national parks sit. Um, I wanted to particularly pick out Adrian Phillips in the audience because actually one of the reasons I'm here, I think, is because of Adrian Phillips, who uh, uh, we worked together with to, to stage a, the last World Parks Congress, which was in Durban in South Africa, which is where I went to university. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm doing a little bit of a throwback, and also uh, there's a reason for the throwback, in that at that time we were very, very fortunate to have as a patron of a Congress, Nelson Mandela, who really, again, set some challenges in place, said, you know, we really have to break with some of these traditional ways that we think about, th about things, and also catalyze new relationships to do things in, 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 in different ways in the future. So that's very inspired uh, by that, and I worked for the Parks Agency in that region when we were doing this particular part of the work. But that meeting and the ideas that people like all of you put on the table were incredibly influential. They were virtually written word for word into the first multilateral agreement amongst the countries around the world in the Convention on Biological Diversity um, to create a program of work on protected areas. With uh, Helen, all the targets and goals and timelines and, and all of those things. Um, and the, but, but this has actually really changed the way many, many countries have approached the task and also opened up the scope of what that task is. I'll try and go into that a little. And because I've picked on, on Adrian, and uh, again, Adrian did an amazing job uh, some time ago, actually just before the, the Parks Congress in Durban, to look at the, uh, let's say, the heritage of Parks Congresses, which are only held every 10 years, starting in Seattle in the 1950s, 60s, yeah, and then coming all the way through to the present day, so we're at the sixth. Um, and what, what happened in that process was that the preoccupations of protected areas managers moved, starting off really with this particular thing about let's, let's, let's establish these places, um, moving, uh, really focusing on what it took to make uh, protected areas work, moving on, and then as time went by, opening up the scope of that to involve communities, to look at uh, development and regional planning, indigenous peoples, and as we got through to Durban, very much more strong focus on, on governance. So there's a there's a heritage and also a kind of a, a life cycle, if you like, of how things move on and they respond to the conditions and context in which they have to operate. Um, so let's fast forward to uh, just recently with the, the world having published a, a new global biodiversity outlook. And we, I think we can be pretty proud. Um, the, the, it, it, re it refers to the HE targets, which are a set of 20 targets that were agreed in Nagoya in Japan in 2010. And target 11 focuses on protected and conserved areas. It is one of the only arrows in the list of 20 targets that is positive and green and going forward to actually conserve the most important terrestrial and inland watered areas and coastal and marine areas, areas of particular importance for biodiversity and making sure that they're ecologically represented, all those sorts of things. Um, even on the issue of equitable and effective management and being well connected and integrated into the landscape, we're doing pretty well. So there's very good outlook to suggest that the world could achieve some of those targets. But when you look at just the next one, which is about species, it's pretty bleak, despite the fact that we're doing really well in protected areas, 
we're watching the world's biodiversity catastrophically decline and, and, and actually go backwards. Um, we're losing ground and so on. So, you know, the, it creates a conundrum about what it is that we're not doing. Um, it's obviously not because we've established protected areas that species are going into decline. It's despite the fact. The counterfactual would be without the world's protected areas, we'd have a, an, an even worse situation to deal with. So we managed to bring 6,000 people to Sydney in Australia in November to ponder some of those issues and to try and look behind the scene as to what it is that, that is going wrong. And I'd like, you, I'd like you all to think in your own space, if you like, about the challenges that you face and do you relate to any of these issues and if so, what would be the kinds of answers you would give? Um, it's a typical uh, gathering. I'm just going to uh, once again also bring your greetings from our new Director General who's sitting in the center, Inga Anderson. Um, who participated in the Congress even before she took on, on the job of being uh, our, our new Director General. But it's a typical gathering where people debate and come up with issues. And what we were really trying to do in Sydney was, to, was three main things. Um, we styled it around the issue of parks, people and planet. Uh, not because it's simply a list of things that needed to be accomplished, but because there's a connection between these. And the previous speakers have already referred to that. Um, the issue is we have protected areas but sometimes they're not well supported and we need more of them and where's that all going to come from? But to, to achieve that we need to find better and fairer ways to conserve. Um, going back to Helen's point, where's the heart in that? It's only people who care, and Peter made the same point, it's only people who care that can actually advance the, this particular agenda. And people care because they're introduced to conservation before they're 12 years, years old. Most of their attitudes, most of their behaviors are established then. The average age of visitors to US national parks is over 60 years old. So something really bad has happened in the intervening years that we've kind of lost not just one, but perhaps two generations. And the other thing is that the world is facing a crisis. We have the crisis of climate change, we have the crisis of uh, uh, morbidity, increased adult mortality related to lifestyle, and where are we in that equation? If we're not relevant, um, how do we... It, it's, it's not really a case of if we're not relevant, what's the consequence? It, it's, it, it's really the opposite argument. We have established protected areas because they have value for society, and sometimes we've forgotten to understand that that's what society needs from protected areas and to make the right connections to achieve that. So um, ultimately, Sydney came up with, some, with an outcome that wasn't a program of work on protected areas. We didn't want to add to the world's list of work plans and uh, strategies that would occupy everybody's time. What we wanted to do really was to inspire. We wanted people to, to say, we're committed to doing more, we're committed to doing better, we're committed to understanding what works and why and to try and apply those as solutions to the, the challenges. So there was that issue. Um, there was a sp specific focus on oceans because of the really poor state of conservation of the world's oceans. But you'll see right in the center this issue of inspiring people people across cultures, people across generations, the migrants that are moving from one part of the world to the other, the people that are um, arriving in new countries and don't necessarily have that lifelong association with, with the areas that they move to. And of course we also need a commitment to invest. Um, we need to invest in the fact that without nature the world would be in a, in a, in, in a greater plight. There would be less carbon uh, stored in the forest and more, more in the atmosphere. And we have to look at the issue of disasters, people's food and water security, and their human health and, and dignity. So Sydney came up with a quite a strong, um, let's say, vision of what the future could hold. And then a challenge to everybody, I mean, since we're in the nature of challenges, um, to, to put that into practice. So not to just... Uh, have a theory, uh, but to actually say, well, where in the world have we got effective 
uh, programs to inspire young people. Where in the world are we able to restore forests and capture more carbon and, and achieve a, a neutral carbon uh, situation in the atmosphere? So I just wanted to, at this stage of the talk, to just highlight those things. So that's what Sydney was all about, and I'll be really happy to chat to you more about that. Um, but we did move to the next stage, was, which was to ask for commitments. And Adrian and others might remember that in Durban, the president of Madagascar stood up and made a commitment to treble the size of the protected area system. And he came to Sydney, or his successor came to Sydney, to explain to the world that they had done it. Um, and the challenge was to other countries and other organizations to follow suit. We had 57 such like commitments coming out of Sydney, and now we have the job in IUCN of monitoring <laughs> to make sure that everybody does what they promised to do. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there really, but I wanted to then highlight so three big areas that I think are food for thought that, that I've been traveling around the world working with a lot of different national governments uh, recently, and these are some of the issues that are coming up. The, the main thing is really rooted on this issue of parks, people, and planet. And a perception that some of you might share that, that people are disconnected and unsupportive, that the parks themselves are threatened and under-resourced, and that the planet is in crisis and we're competing with everybody else's priorities. But it's a, very, it's a very negative and unmotivating point of view. Promise of Sydney wanted to do exactly the opposite. It said, hang on, this is rubbish. Um, we we're, we're actually have an investment in the future that we're not even recognizing is, is so powerful. So one of the things that came up really, really strongly from Sydney was this issue of progress and, and non-regression. Um, we don't want to see protected areas and conserved areas becoming paper parks and, uh, and managed poorly. And that means a number of things apart from the ones that are on the screen about having them in the right places and making sure they're representative and particularly including uh, the roles of many, many different stakeholders. Um, most national governments in the world still do not recognize the role of private conservation, the role of indigenous peoples, the role of communities in the overall system of national parks. And even if they do, institutionally, they're not connected and don't see themselves in a common vision. So raising the bar is something we think is really important. And what we, um, what we are trying to do was to, to put attention on the fact that these protected areas have to work. So one of the big topics that is on the table for the world's protected areas is a new standard, um, which IUCN, uh, through its Congress, has agreed to develop a green list instead of a red list. We wanted to move away from, the, if you like, the doom and gloom focusing on what's going wrong to focusing on what's going right. Um, and what we have done then is to, is to really look I mean, objectively over the 210,000 or more protected areas in the world, recognizing that about only 30% of them are managed effectively. What does that mean? Um, it's great to go and measure everybody's performance, but what we're really concerned with is, do they work? Do they achieve what they're supposed to achieve? So we're trying to um, find a way to objectively and independently measure and assure uh, whoever supports and creates these systems that they actually achieve their outcomes. Um, I won't go into the detail because there's not a lot of um, time in, in, in a talk like this, but. Essentially, we want to uh, measure conservation success. If it's Dartmoor and you have a set of objectives, are they being met? And how do you know that? Um, sometimes we just measure whether there's a budget, whether there's effective staff, uh, you know, whether there are enough vehicles to do the job. But are we measuring whether the iconic, unique biodiversity of Dartmoor is persisting? Um, is, are, are we measuring whether the communities that depend on their livelihoods from the park are actually achieving those livelihoods? And is it equitable? So this standard is an extremely complex thing to, to get to grips with. What we have done is through a pilot uh, uh, process created, if you like, a progression 
where um, protected areas can voluntarily submit themselves to a process of gathering the right kind of implementation, information, moving into candidacy, and then ultimately IUCN would say, we would award you for a period of time this uh, title, if you like, of being on the green list. It's not a gold badge, it's a, it's a recognition of that, that the, in, the, the minimum standard is being met. Um, and I wanted to take it a little bit further. It's provoked a lot of interest, this uh, idea, that, for example, the German Development Bank says, we've always wanted a way. We, we're investing millions and millions, hundreds of millions of euros in protected areas in Africa, but we're not sure whether that money is actually achieving the kind of incremental progress. So this could be a way that we can justify our continued support for those. Um, and, and it really requires that we... We have some way of measuring the impact of investment through an objective and independent uh, assurance procedure. Um, just to take it from to a financial point of view, this was a study that McKinsey did with WWF looking at the current investment in, in conservation and realizing that it actually should be 20 to 30 times that. And the issue was where is all this money going to come from? So looking across investment portfolios, um, they really uh, decided, a, a couple of people have decided to design some financial investment products that would attract impact investment that could perhaps be allocated towards the improvement and progress of protected areas. Just the last 1% of investment would be bigger than this gap. So, um, but we don't have those financial products to actually attract people to do this and we don't have the way we can assure them that their investment is achieving this. So we, we're working with a number of financial institutions now to try and test this particular process. One of the first of these is uh, Credit Suisse and Altelia have opened a conservation note um, which kind of achieved the deal of the year for 2015. It was fully subscribed within about 10 days and is being invested in um, reforestation in a particular landscape and, and to promote uh, sustainable agriculture. So we're saying, well, what is it that we can do in protected and conserved areas that would attract impact investors uh, who are interested in social and biological and, and, uh, and outcomes as, and not only financial returns? Um, so the main issue is, can we, con can we find a, a, a conservation finance investment vehicle that would finance the projects and achieve the benefits that we're looking for. So I just throw that out as a teaser. I'll leave it to George Mombio after me to tear it apart, um, which I'm sure I'd love to hear him do. Um, by the way, speaking between the Prince of Wales and George Mombio is quite a challenge in itself. <laughs> um, I, was just, I just came from Brazil this, uh, on Sunday, and I was really, very, uh, I was really amazed that the... Um, the public, the tri tribunal of public accounts is focusing on how are protected areas performing in terms of what the state invests in them. And they have measured on a very crude scale how all of the protected areas in the Amazon are doing. This is the public court of accounts. It's a very interesting independent process. So I think to complete this um, element of, of my talk, um, raising the bar means uh, performance, and it means being able to measure and independently verify that protected areas are doing what they're supposed to do. And we're hoping that the Green List will help promote that process. So let's talk about it if we can. The second big item that I'd like to talk about is really this issue of governance. Um, in Durban, we had an appreciation that we had to involve all actors in the governance of protected areas. It's a kind of hidden conservation. If you add up what governments are designating in terms of protected areas, and you add to that what indigenous peoples have been managing, maybe without the conscious, uh, let's say, articulation of a conservation goal, what local communities are doing and what this growing private sector movement is doing, it's a huge uh, set of hidden conservation which isn't entirely recognized, um, but it's, it, it needs a better framework. It needs to be recognized in law. It needs to uh, focus on, on uh, social equity and rights. 
and it needs to confront the idea that we are only dealing with economies that require growth um, and further exploitation of natural resources in order to achieve uh, social, social justice. So there's, a, there's something very deep and meaningful in all of this, that protected areas, because they're everywhere in the world, in every landscape, in every society, can be the nodes of a new thinking, perhaps, of how people relate to nature and what we find valuable and what we invest in and how that forms part of our lives. Um, so here's another area to work on is, is governance. What do we mean by governance quality? We know what diversity means, but we don't even measure that. Um, but what about the quality and what about the resilience of our governance system to deal with threats like cuts in budgets and, you know, uh, further exploitation um, for you know, major, major consumer products. Um, a really interesting study uh, has, has started the, the thinking about that, looking at privately protected, privately conserved areas. And I wanted to just zoom in on the, now I don't want you to read this whole matrix, but we tend to get fixated, and um, we're all guilty of it, on what do we mean? What do we mean by a national park? What do we mean by a protected landscape? And we don't often think about the diversity of approaches that deliver conservation, whether it's by government or by private peoples or by indig indigenous peoples and local communities. So expanding our frame. And here you are. We just saw a, a great, great movie about Dartmoor and we've heard words about that. You're doing that. You're actually in a landscape with shared multi-agency governance testing how the institutions work. And I think places like this and the places like the rest of the UK national parks have something to offer to not, not filling in the matrix, but actually understanding how that's done in practice. Um, so many of you are probably aware of the putting nature on the map study that was done for the UK. The UK has the best data set for protected areas in the whole world because of this study, um, which it's the best recognition of all the different forms of protected and conserved areas that together make up the landscape. So I think I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that you're leaders in this field. So the, the question is, um, what makes that work? What are these institutions? What are the mechanisms? Can that information be shared and, and help others around the world to achieve a similar kind of embeddedness in the landscape? So, um, and then, of course, the same words. Um, Sydney really put a focus on inspiring a new generation. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but there are a whole bunch of elements to this, including, as I mentioned before, migrants. Uh, Canada has a very interesting approach when new citizens are inducted. Um, they do that while they're standing in a national park. So they swear an oath of allegiance, but they do so in a national park. I mean, that could be done here too. Uh, I don't want to tease you too much. Um, <laughs> but we have, we have all sorts of opportunities through social media uh, of, of actually drawing uh, young people into a love of nature. To be, people learn when they can face and deal with issues. They don't learn because you give them information. I have a confession to make. I'm also a school teacher. Who was, who was. But if I took children out and said, this factory is polluting this river, what are we going to do about it? We got much more action than, than just talking about it in theory. Can someone guide me about time? Just so I know, chair? My Swiss watch is not telling me the right thing. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's 10 minutes to go. So, so this issue um, really of protected areas embedded in society, coming from society, involving society and achieving social justice and social equity is a very important element which I think needs further study. It's not only about the economic benefits of protected areas, it's about the social benefits, how these, these areas become part of every, everyday thinking about the world, about dealing with the kinds of problems that the world faces. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and the third point that I'd like to move on to, the last major point, is um, this conundrum about relevance. Um, we, a, a group of us, 
faced with that issue about, you know, why are many of the major conservation agencies in the world devolving responsibility for protecting, losing responsibility? Even, even, um, even IUCN, where I come from, questioned whether we needed a global protected areas program. And many, many, many agencies have done this. And we said, well, maybe we're not getting the message out or maybe we're not engaging the right audience with our messages. And so uh, with colleagues, we, we decided to zoom in on the climate change issue and look at protected areas from the point of view of the people that are trying to solve the climate crisis and ask ourselves, what were we doing to support that? The logic is quite clear when you look at it. This is an old slide of mine dragged out from years ago. But I mean, our central logic is that if we maintain intact natural ecosystems, we'll sustain the functions that they, that they, they support, like uh, carbon storage and for adaptation, water and other, and other services. But it's the unique nature of protected areas and the institutionalization that allows that to happen. They're, they're places, they're definable. Uh, they have definable institutions that create permanence. Uh, we can measure uh, performance. Um, and we can therefore help achieve goals that other people cannot achieve and we, we're going to watch the world struggling with this year after year after year. But we have again, again a kind of a hidden solution. Without the carbon stored in the world's forests and including in Dartmoor, the world would be in a much greater predicament. So why don't we do more, not less of that? Um, sounds obvious. Colombia, where I was just a few weeks ago, the president said to all of the agencies, what kind of pledges can we make in Paris in December to the, to the climate talks, the, the intended national contributions? And he challenged them uh, to come up with um, two million hectares of new protected areas in Colombia that would help achieve both carbon uh, emission mitigation goals as well as uh, support adaptation to climate change in Colombia. And so the, the protected area agency has a new mandate and a, a, a new rationale for, for being relevant in that society and globally. So it's, it's, a, it's really interesting. How will they do it? They can't do it by just proclaiming more things. They've got to go and look at who's conserving these areas, how to involve them more, um, whether they're municipalities or national parks authorities or indigenous peoples. Another argument which is really gaining ground, which the video earlier uh, talked about, was this whole issue of health and well-being. It seems perfectly logical. Adult mortality in the world is mainly 67%, I think, due to lifestyle-related uh, diseases. Peter mentioned a couple of these, but cardiac, pulmonary, diabetes, mental disorders, um, are all, they're all related to a lack of exercise. So Parks Victoria has done a study on the explicit facts of um, who is exercising in the national parks to calculate the avoided health care costs to that society and therefore the actual contribution that, that the parks are, are, are making to, to, to national health and well-being. And they've calculated an annual $200 million benefit. This is, this is avoided health care costs. This isn't a kind of economic value. This is what they would otherwise have had to pay out to deal with, uh, with an, the, the incremental uh, health disorder against their whole budget, which is just over $300 million. And of course, they're also producing recreation. Uh, they're conserving biodiversity. They are they're supporting the water supplies of the country. And I know you've done a study for UK national parks, but it, it needs to get right down to the, not to the economic concept, but to the actual cost. And um, this is a way that we can make protected areas part of this really big dilemma that society faces, which is to reconcile development with the ongoing conservation of biodiversity. I just have a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll refer to a couple of, of cases like this that inspire me and that I think uh, you could add to if you just found the time to, to assemble the evidence. So, protected areas in Colombia just cover 10% of the country, provide 50% of the water. Um, 
but they're at risk from climate change, from overgrazing, from the you know, incessant needs of the society. Bogota has 8 million people. 80% of its water comes from one national park, Chingasa National Park. Without that park, Bogota dies. Um, the cost of replacing that water can be calculated. This is not the economic value of water. <laughs> This is the cost to the municipality of Bogota of, of actually providing the water to, and it comes for free, from Chingasa National Park. But what they have done is set up a very interesting exchange mechanism where um, they are actually paying the providers of that water, the users of that park, to restore parts of that ecosystem, and they're getting the money from the revenues um, in Bogota. So, there are lots of examples like this around the world, but they, they get beyond the issue of saying, well, of course this stuff's valuable. They get to the issue of that if you have to replace that water and pay for it from somewhere else, uh, this is what it's going to cost the society. You can preempt that by investing in this ecosystem. Um, another one, and the last one, I'll, I don't want to take you too much into this, but we've seen this massive increase, not in the incidence of hurricanes and earthquakes and so on, but in the consequences of them because of the way ecosystems are degraded. And Japan, Japan was pretty shocked by the earthquake on the northeastern coastline. But they've responded. Um, I, I won't touch there. They've responded, and this is their slide, so sometimes it, it reads a bit strangely, but they've taken that 700 kilometer of coastline They've consolidated all the existing and now damaged protected areas on that coastline and are creating what they're calling the San Rico Fuku, which is a reconstruction national park, to restore not only the psyche of the people who live in that landscape, but they see this as the opportunity to replan and redesign and avoid this kind of uh, disaster. It's really interesting. What was even more interesting is they took it straight to the UN con conference on disaster risk reduction to build ecosystem-based approaches into that. And we were able to support that by offering tools about how protected areas can support disaster risk reduction. And you have great examples in the UK where you could probably do that too. So I'm running out of time. So the point here is about protected and conserved areas have got to add value, can add value, and we have to figure out ways of communicating that value and engaging with the sectors that really want uh, that kind of support. It's a, it's, a, it's a different way, perhaps, of looking at the same problem. We're not com communicating why protected are important. We're saying to people, we're coming to help you solve your problem. So, um, going back to Adrian's analysis, and Adrian, we haven't done this analysis yet. <laughs> But I did a quick one in Brasilia the other day saying, yeah, what did Sydney cover and what do the recommendations talk to? And they talk to most of the things that we have built up over the years. But they actually talk to a whole lot of new ones. Um, and this is, I think, is the zone where we could all focus a little bit more and use our understanding of how protected areas work to do that. So to, to finish off, I have to then go back to this issue of capacity. Most of us, like myself, we grew up running to the, the nearest protected area. We studied biology, we became researchers or rangers, um, but we never learned how to do those things. We never learned what climate change would do and how to engage with the climate sector or the health sector. And so there's this whole issue of not only becoming competent uh, to deal with new things, but professionalizing that competence. And I think that's a new challenge for all of us, is to actually through our efforts, through practice, to actually build up a body of knowledge, competence, and uh, if you like, uh, accredited professional qualifications that would actually make this a profession. It's one of the few occupations in the world that everywhere, but doesn't have a standards body, or maybe we don't need that. <laughs> so um, I wanted to mention there are many things that we can do. We can support analysis, research, articles, and so on to, to actually um, to actually inculcate that knowledge. So back to my, uh, perhaps the final, this is the final slide, is that the conundrum isn't a conundrum if we connect the dots, basically, parks, people, and planet. If we look at fairness, justice, and inclusivity, if we contribute solutions and not more problems, 
um, and we demonstrate that protected areas are successful and valuable to society, if we do all of those things together, then we're much more likely to achieve not only the promise of Sydney, but the promise that you all hold and that you all aspire to.